So today, what what we want to talk about is humor, um, humanity, and the human interaction. And so something that really kind of came up when I was talking to the two of you is that there are actually no human figures in your works. <laughs> um, aha! Aha! But what we have in Brad's work is is these toys, figurines, and but yeah, and they all, they, and those represent people, right? Yeah, but they're not, but they're not living, breathing people, right? Um, yeah. and 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 the, in some ways, there are just so many different aspects of people, um, but they're not people, and then um, Javon. There are no people in your landscape. Now we see what people have done and added to the landscape. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but but no people in there. Um, and um, okay, wait. So this is perfect. So uh, Marilyn Manning says just saying hello from Phonetica, New York. Phoenicia. And, hey, Marilyn. <laughs> yeah. Nice oh, Phoenicia. <laughs> uh, from one yeah, who. Welcome from one who loves humor. So so let's talk about that. Let's talk about why you as artists um, are are portraying scenes, whether um, wittingly or unwittingly, um, that doesn't have humans in it. Uh, you want me to start since I'm spotlighted right now, Rose? Yeah, go for it. All righty. Um, yeah, well, so, so for me, that kind of was a, a, a left turn when I uh, came to New Mexico. I, I was still doing figures, you know, and so I, one of my m more successful paintings, you know, was a, a, a figure I did of, of my wife, Clara. Um, and uh, at some point, the landscape kind of just started to get my attention and all the motion and things happening in the landscape ended up pulling me out into the back of my truck and painting on location as I do with all these paintings. And um, I think initially I just was excited that I could go outside and do something outside. And so being outside and working seemed like the most fun thing I could do. But in the last decade or so, it's, it's become more clear to me that the, it's not so much that I choose to not paint people. I think if I was, you know, like, um, one of my favorite paintings I did, you know, before 2010 was a ocean, uh, a scene on a beach uh, with a bunch of people um, waiting for a fish, fishermen to pull in a catch. And the the mass of people in that case to me was uh, an amazing thing that I would, I would love to return to. So it's, it's not some hard ideological position that leads to people not being in my work. I think part of it is the reality of living in the West, that there's... Um, not a lot of people in a lot of places that you can you can go all day long and not see a single person and so a lot of the places around taos where i am the vista doesn't have people in it and it, and it ends up being a simple that's what i'm it's it's compelling it's huge for whatever reason landscape has pulled my attention and there and then there aren't that many people that are evident in it um but i think beyond that it's become more and more interesting to me how painting something that is inhuman in, in, in most definitions, you know, the landscape weather mm -hmm. ends up pointing back to the experience of being human. And so by the absence that's uh, of any, you know, identifiable person in my work, it ends up leaving the conversation and something else than the story about a person, you know, like the, the self portrait of me in a bathroom that I did is people always wonder, why don't you have your shirt on Javon? And why are you wearing rubber gloves and looking uh, like a creep? You know, like I have this yeah, right, right. self portrait in the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's the story of the person. And this, you know, the, the painting of Clara, I mentioned earlier, that's a story. There's a story that the, the personness pulls out. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the case of landscape, the, there isn't that story that develops. And so what, what ends up happening, at least for me, is, is uh, questions about the landscape. But then there's a bigger sort of what is it to be a human type of question that's that's been on my mind a lot in the last year. And so 
you know, with this big storm behind me here, this piece is a 48 by 84 inch piece. And, you know, it's painted with ridiculous amount of paint as I usually do these days. Wow. But what's at the bottom there is a bunch of the agricultural fields mm -hmm. that add a geometry. And so there's this sort of almost cacophonous sagebrush, sorry for the wobbling, but cacophonous sagebrush at the bottom of the piece and then the agricultural grid and fields in the mm. lower middle and then the mountains with this sort of undulating muscularity and then this almost I don't know, obscene, <laughs> obscenely stormy sky, you know, that day. Yeah. And uh, for me, the implications of human activity amidst something much larger is just infinitely interesting more and more. Um, and I think that doing landscape has led me to a place where I'm thinking about what it is to be a human on earth and, you know, what is sort of shared amongst, uh, all people in one way or another is the inescapable connection to nature. However, mm. apparently distant that might be if we're, you know, in a complete urban area and we never get out of the, you know, concrete sort of life, you might say, well, I'm not connected to nature, but of course you are. You're everything about that is made of nature. It's just been reshaped in every single flow and all the, all the things that go on in a city are inescapably involved with everything else that is happening yeah. in a rural area too. Yeah. So I want you to talk about the absence of actual figure. Like there's figures, but they're toy figures. Um, yeah. and, and so I want to bring you in on that. Um, and then kind of, because I think, I think both of you are like your work implies human touch in it. Your work implies that humans have done something to the landscape, Javon, have um, created these toys, Brad, have set these toys up in this situation, in this motif um, that you are painting. Um, and there's a commentary. And, um, and for sure with your work, um, I, I have this sense too, that there's a lighthearted playfulness. Um, there's all that kind of stuff going on with it. Um, and so I'm going to throw a question that I think Gary Schoenbacher has put very well. Um, so I'm going to toss this out at you. Gary writes, I often write humor in my work and later edit it out because it seems gratuitous or in counterpoint to the tone and theme of the piece. Other times, I think what's wrong with gratuitous gratuitous humor or whimsy, um, how do you decide in your work what to put in or keep out? So how do you play humor in your work? That for me? Yeah, you. Yeah, Brad. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, wow, I really love that comment. My goodness. Um, how do you decide, decide what to keep in or leave out? I, I mean, it's like everything in your life if, for me. If I enjoy it and it makes me laugh and makes me happy, then I keep it. You know, so that goes in. Um, I mean, there's the aesthetic. A lot of a lot of my paintings are sort of minimalistic in the sense that they sort of zoom in on one toy uh, or one scene or something. There's there's not usually a lot of stuff going on. We're usually being invited in to investigate the reality of, of one one toy at a time mm -hmm. um, and really really look at the the patina the color and that's how i paint them too you know i painting one thing at a time one painting at a time and i would say the only person in the painting is the viewer in the end for initially it's me you know and i have a response to the object that ends up in the painting. And then the viewer has a response, you know, twice removed. It's like the, the object, then the painting. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the, uh, that's the fun. <laughs> At that point, you know, I mean, it's interesting to compare it to writing. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And, and so, so, so this just really struck me in both of your work, but, but in any kind of painting, right, the person brings their own baggage to the experience. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's true in any relationship. <laughs> right? So with your work, finding that humor, like yeah. I think the person walking into it, 
um, yeah. is going to take a look at that and say, oh, I had those. I remember that. Or how yeah. you set that up? That is yeah. the sense of whimsy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so based on Bruce. that. Yeah. And even if you even if you as a child didn't have those or these particular toys, mm -hmm. you had toys and you played, you know, so that sense of play, I, you know, I enjoy having that sense of play woken up in me. Yeah. And that that makes me happy in life. Just aside from painting, you know, I mean, the paintings are just a thing I do, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's just, I do a lot of things and I try to bring a sense of play to all of it. Um, because I just, I, you know, that's just my personality, I think, yeah. but, uh, and I, and I, but I believe it's true for everybody. I think, I think that that is always there, never leaves. And that the sense of wonder, play, joy, um, sense of humor, that you have as a kid is the same, you know, you keep it. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to make contact with the viewer and bring them in and say, like, like, isn't this beautiful that we get to be human and have this, have all of these, uh, these aspects to us. And I, you know, so I'm just enjoying it with, with the viewer so and when i get to go to shows and it sucks this year i didn't get to I do know. that for, you know i didn't get to be in contact with people and and um really um discuss paintings and so i i appreciate this these zoom calls because this is at least an opportunity to interact in a way you know um that's available to us uh, to make contact with people through the through the art so let's dig into something that I, I think is is happening in in your work in both of both of you is that you are are implicit. You are woven through these works. These are your personal experiences. Um, these are a, a vision and a thought. And I think that if we were to compile your work throughout the course of your life, even to like right now or if we were to look back on that i think you could probably put a timeline on and say this is when javon's um, daughter was born you know um this is when brad moved to utah this is when you know what i mean like so yeah. i'm wondering yeah. So, so I think what I would love to hear you both talk about a little bit in the work where it is right now is um, what kinds of things, you know, here we are in this really tumultuous time in our country. Um, hopefully things are settling down a little bit, but, you know, we've got COVID, we've got quarantine, we've got the changeover in presidency, we've got riots and all this kind of stuff. I'm wondering for me and for the people listening, would you talk about how you respond to the world through your work and whoever wants to go first? Yeah, I, I got something. I'm you go first. first. All right, man. <laughs> it's really fun to meet you via Zoom. I just got to say, because I've loved your work at Altamira, seeing it and, you know, at the, at the course show and such. It's fun. Hey, hey same, so, same fun on now. this end, buddy. I love your stuff. <laughs> yeah, so it's Very great. Very visceral, but, beautiful use of paint. I love yeah. it. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. Well, so... Um, Rose, that the, the question, I, I like that question, especially because you bring up my daughter, right? And I've been saying a lot in the Instagram live stuff, you know, in the little online courses and stuff I do that more and more I come to feel that the shape of one's life as an artist ends up dictating a lot of what work you end up doing. What, what ends up becoming art history is sort of like if there was like the backstory biography, you know, it'd be like Picasso had a crappy night and was like seeing sideways and then his smashed up faces happened or whatever, you know, like who knows what life, actual life experience went into the shape of something mega important historically. And really they're all just these people with a beautiful or a mess of a life, whatever, depending on the particular artist. And in my case, I've thought a lot about it, especially because of my daughter coming into the world that her being around and, and me and my wife both wanting to be as full-time parents as we could be meant that I 
changed what I made artistically as a result of the personal life and the, you know, the amount of love and the openness and the challenges and the sleeplessness and all the other things that go into being a human and a parent. And therefore what I was painting changed. So I scaled in like my last couple of years of work had been primarily just Taos, you know, and, and really then if, if I'm scaling in on a particular area, you know, when I first started doing landscape, I was everywhere in the Southwest because I was like, Oh my God, it's amazing. Let me go to freaking Utah. Let me go to a grand Canyon. It didn't matter anything that was amazing. I would go to, and more and more, like the, the the diversity of that experience was really important for understanding what I cared about beyond the big view or what I cared about as a person in the world that is after a while where you live is kind of where you are. And so this last year, especially with my daughter and, and, and or a couple of years and having a you know piece of land in Taos where I live is where I am. And the art coming out of that has been something that's changed the shape of everything. And so like this painting behind me is one of however many 13 paintings at that spot. The other um, piece that I have in the show, still this one, there's a new set of forest river paintings on the way to Taos Ski Valley, you know, and that's like uh, just a river there. And, and then this big tree is in the middle and Taos land trust land and here in town. And they're all within like, you know, 20 minutes of each other at most. And each a part of a series of work looking at time and change in one spot and so as my attention as life has in, in, uh, imposed some restrictions on my creative process then also my attention changed as a response and the adjustment led to thinking about the world differently and similarly with the case of all the stuff going on in the world this year or whatever else the intensity that I was feeling stuff say in my body just in terms of stress level meant that I started going to some locations I'd been working on and was more familiar with rather than bumping off to a bunch of new questions that were more destabilizing to my creative process at a new spot or a new subject matter. And the result was actually a deepening of, a, of, of an inquiry that I didn't expect. So like hmm. it's, it's led to me wanting to go back to those places even more now because I found that I broke through a barrier creatively about how I thought about my work in terms of what it is to paint, to be a human in the landscape and how it, how we change through time, how the spots that we are change through time. And even one place could be a, just an infinite source of inspiration. And, and like Brad said, with one toy, like you could sit probably, I bet you could paint one toy like a billion times just around each spot. And because it's like the deeper, like what Warhol did with a Brillo box. I mean, like anything can be art if you look deeply enough at it. And if you do, then it's like a key kind of cracks open and, you know, or a lock does. And it's like a key and something happens that spirals out from that. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot about that this year, especially because even more restriction with travel has been imposed aside from, you know, my own family life and whatever else. And it's led to like 35 paintings at the Taos Gorge and, you know, whatever. It's going to be a lot more of these too now. So that's yeah. my somewhat long winded yeah. answer. Well, and so like that key that unlocks that thing um, is you being in the right place, but being ready to draw that experience your experience and what's happening like like you could make these parallels with you know that tumultuous sky and sure. and you know and it's sifting in what's happening in the world or in growth in a place that you go back to all the time and watching your your child grow you know things like that sure. um and uh so you know let me just let me just read a couple of these comments and um then i have a, a specific question for you brad um uh so uh, Michael Smith, one of our great um, uh, attendees who's been to many talks, good to see you, Michael, I'm glad you made it, writes, um, so this relationship between artists and peace, between buyer and peace and between buyer and artist seems to be based on a gut reaction. I know that as I have gotten older and have had more experiences buying art and meeting artists, there is a moment when I see something, when I say, I want that. Yeah. Sure. Right. Um, 
It may not fit with what other art I own, nor may it fit with any realistic definition of a collection, but the piece speaks to me in a commanding voice saying, take me home. That is a voice I have learned to obey because my emotional reaction is telling me that the artist connected with the artist's vision and emotion. And that I think is really something that I want to get to the heart of. That is exactly it. And, you know, I, I've heard artists, well, artists have asked me and I know they've asked other gallerists, hey, what's hot? What's selling? Well, that's a horrible, that's not an, uh, yeah, right? Is it just like you just went, ah, that's, yeah. that's not how an artist thinks, right? It's like, what is connecting for me? Um, I, hope, for, 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 I hope that's definitely the ideal place to live in. And I, it's very painful to even... Well, 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 we all, we yeah. all, I mean, okay. we all, I mean, the, the old adage is, I mean, and it goes for everything. Follow your heart or follow, follow your, your bliss or whatever, you know, I mean, when you're making art, <laughs> you know, follow the genuine spirit that is guiding you mm-hmm. and make, make what you sincerely want to offer. Um, you know, I mean, you don't want it because, because art is like, it's almost like a prayer, you know, you're offering what's the best of you, what, you know, your highest self, your highest aspiration, the most love you can give is your art, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to go like, you know, let's, I guess let's keep the prayer metaphor going. You know, you don't want to offer a contrived prayer, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it's like, what do I, because I don't know. It's interesting. I'm not, I'm not a super religious person, but this metaphor is apt. You know, I mean, you don't want to, it's like if you offer this, this uh, curated prayer to the gods, <laughs> they're going to know, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're in, you know what I mean? And uh, if you offer, you know, um, something insincere in the hopes that you'll score a hit, you know, I mean, with music, they, people can hear it. People can yeah. see it in art. You'll, you're found out as soon as you do it, and you haven't connected with yourself first, and you're not connecting with the most sincere person who would um, love what you do because nobody knows what you do because you did something to try to please the market. Right. And, and you got you got to – you got to be sincere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think as a collector, you got to be sincere. You end up with something that doesn't bring you joy. Right. You know, and that was something I just, I just wrote a blog about the five um, most frustrating things about buying artwork. Um, and from, for artists, for gallerists, for buyers, you know, and so, you know, um, one of those is really, you know, uh, woven throughout that is making that connection and trusting your gut with it as michael is saying in his comments here which you know he he goes on to write in the few times that i have disregarded that voice i've always regretted not buying that piece yeah the times i have made that mistake are moments that i recall with extraordinary clarity and regret oh boy and i, I think, totally relate to that i, I collect art too, me too. And I, there are a couple of paintings that i bought that i didn't buy the ones i the ones i have you know i've when I took action on my intuition and my, you know, what, what my heart was saying, I have those things and I look at them every day and I love them. And man, there's one painting. Oh, Ooh. And I, I had the money. I was ready to pull the trigger and I didn't do it. And, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, I think about it often. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think, and then I, I, um, I think that, um, and I've said this many times to artists, I think collectors respond to that, that yeah. you have painted or created or sculpted or whatever, this thing that is so authentic in your being that you don't even have to be there that the collector responds to it. And I think the collector asks a lot of questions. Um, The collector needs to be open-minded 
certainly I've walked into, you know, a museum or a gallery space and had a reaction to something that was not positive. Um, but, you know, that is, but it, as a human, if we can stop and say, why did I have that reaction? I need to ask some questions here. Um, so I think, I think it's exactly like what we're all talking about here, that everybody plays a part and that part is reacting in an authentic way. Um, John, you had a comment? Yeah, yeah, generally, this is fun. I, I really, I like the, uh, this particular sort of, the context of, of coming at it, um, Michael, from the collector side of things, mm -hmm. as well as the artist side of things. Is, I know there's a lot of parallels and like, I think at least within the process of working, uh, you know, for me, at least on location, this experience of curating the moment, what to leave in or out, you know, get also back to this piece about humor and writing, right? And how to essentially curate whatever this vision is. And, and, and that it's, it's such a, I mean, a wonderful skill. It's like a great chef at a restaurant who knows how to put together a dish really well. Like that is art that goes into knowing the personality and the moment of every ingredient. And things kind of come together and hopefully teach you something you didn't know about food, <clears throat> for example. Similar in on location work, or, or and, and to hear this sort of digestion of how, how uh, Michael, you talk about choosing a painting of Brad as well, or you know, for what Brad's student, we choose to buy a piece in our house. The, that moment of like guttural, visceral oomph that you can't quite explain, and it can be a negative moment initially. You can have a strong negative response to something, and, and then I can actually turn out to be positive in the end if you sit with that long enough because something sort of like some new some new albums from the, my favorite artists occasionally that first listen i'm like uh no can't do it and then that second listen i'm like i can't stop please more i love what you're up to you know and like that kind of push pull is like this interesting thing because some some works of art it's like you just feel like you've been put to bed and like had a lovely just tucked in so nice and kissed on the cheek and you love it and you want to stay in that artwork forever and other ones you feel like you've kind of been smacked around but then you realize that you're like standing up straighter because you've kind of gotten woken up by something that was really in your face. And then after that, it feels great to hang with that piece of work. Right. So like I, in our house, I think I find there's a few different ways I like to live with work. Same thing, making the paintings, like some days, like I make a piece and I cannot stand to look at whatever's going on on there. And I come back three days later and I realize like, I just needed some time to actually reorient to something that was much more competent than I actually was prepared to see or even aware was developing in my work. And I had to not kill the painting and lose it or whatever, but the, this, this sort of curating the process of making stuff and like being attentive when you get this call and knowing how to listen at the right moment is a, a magic act. I mean, I, I, it's an ever learning, always learning act because, you know, I feel like our collections evolve, right? And you're talking about curating your own collection, how, how, if you have a particular vision and a particular emotion about stuff, well, that I, I, I've spoken with enough collectors to hear how that changes over time. And like the first artist that you loved when you were first starting out and became just enamored with taking art into your home aren't necessarily the ones that you hold on to at 30 years later, right? And that there's this changing evolution to how you relate to the world, which I think is reflected. It's all the same ball, it seems to me, that we're looking into, which is like, as an artist, you're trying to look into something that's true, that inspires something in the world. And there are a bajillion ways to do that, which is why there's so much room for the multiplicity of voices in that act. And as collectors, as, you know, when I'm watching a movie or listening to music, like I'm on the other side of the cycle where I'm taking that in and looking for something in the world that that artist, that particular musician, that particular filmmaker, like, turned in did something really well that set my life, uh, you know, alight, you know, and yeah. I feel like that both sides of that process is a very interesting thing with learning what it is and I, I don't, how you carry that experience is like a whole other thing. And I'm mindful. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, right. but. Well, no, I think, I think there's, well, I think like uh, what I'm hearing too, is that there's a lot of trust um, in the process for artists to trust, you know, if, if you're fighting something, right, you have to trust in the process, walk away. And, and I know writers, Gary's listening. I know writers have to do that too. Like you have to w absolutely walk away. I mean, there are times when, um, I have been right on the edge of deleting an entire reams of what I've written because it's so ugly, but I walk away. 
And when I come back, it's like, oh, that wasn't, <laughs> it's still ugly, but it wasn't that ugly. It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, let me get a couple comments in here. Javon, uh, Paul Primax says, just for the record, cannot get enough of your Tau Scorch paintings. Glad to hear it, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jodell writes, um, all, it, quote, all I did was to look at what the universe showed me to let my brush bear witness to it, Monet. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Michael writes, I wonder how often an artist creates a piece to which the artist is so connected that he cannot bear to let it go, or if the artist has let the piece go and then spends the rest of his life regretting that. <laughs> no, never. No, no. <laughs> no, because you can make another one. Yeah, right. Well, you know what's out there, though, right? You know yeah. yeah, you know what's out there, and I mean, for me, it's it's like it's got its own life, and and my my impetus or the what moves me is the next painting I'm going to do. You know, like before I'm finished, before I'm totally finished with a painting, like I've already I know exactly which one is next, mm -hmm. and I can't wait to get to that one. You know, so I have to be really disciplined mm -hmm. to get done. And before I can keep playing and get on to my next idea, yeah, because it's just, it's such a blast. And I imagine collectors feel that way too. I mean, one of my friends who is an architect and he collects a lot and he has to have things in storage and then he rotates them and um, changes the whole look of the house. And it's, it's really cool. Um, it's a great, but, you know what I mean? When you have a great collection, you can, you can, you can refresh it and move things in and out and change it and just changes the energy of a home. Right. Even to like change it with the seasons or something. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. I want to move on to, to a slightly different aspect of this. And um, what I want to ask you specifically, uh, Brad, is about subject matter and kind of drilling down a little bit more. Um, so, and I'm going to preface this with, you'll notice in the core show that one, we're a contemporary show, right? So by that, I mean it in a number of senses of the word. One, you're living, your contemporaries. Um, two, you're responding to um, current stimulus stimuli, right? Um, you're having this response to it, whether it's the current landscape or these toys, but your response is the contemporary aspect to it. Um, it's also looking at um, painting in a contemporary way, right? So, so Javon with the really thick impasto paint um, and the emotion that comes with that thickness in the paint alone, and then you add in the color and the drama and the vista and the different canvas sizes and juxtapositions of, of how you're laying things out. Um, and Brad, um, the surface isn't the really contemporary thing so much as it is the treatment of the subject. Um, you know, and like the two paintings I'm looking at behind you, how you're also playing with um, this photographic lens in a way, um, in, the, in a painting. Um, so just sort of, and it's sort of almost a little humorous way of, you know, um, of messing with that um, vision, putting people back on their heels a little bit as of what they're looking at. What I want to ask about is this concept of Native American subject matter. Yeah. And, and so I know I've, like, I always talk to artists that if we're having Native American subject matter, um, I want it to be done by Native Americans. Uh, so if you're representing a different culture, um, that, that you are that, that's your culture, you know, that you're representing. And I, and I do that because I feel like there are so many people who use Native American American subject matter um, for, you know, a profit for, uh, you know, but it, but it's not theirs. Um, and you are in this really interesting position because these toys are, some are Native American, some are cowboys, some are, um, and I remember as a curator, and I want you to respond to this too, or have this conversation with me because as a curator, I remember really thinking 
does this break with, um, does this run counter to what I've been saying? Or is this a person's um, looking at how we, uh, um, for these decades before, more of this awakened um, kind of thinking about culture in our country, like this was really typical. Playing cowboys and Indians, we did as kids. We, we always did it as kids. Oh, well, I mean... The, the Boston Tea Party was uh, executed by a bunch of guys dressed up like Indians. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was so. There's actually a really fantastic um, sociological study. Uh, it's, it's a book called "Playing Indian," and it goes through the history of. Uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the author. I have the book in my library, but um, it's that um, the the spiritual need that a lot of the settlers had um, maybe, you know, and I'm hypothesizing here. I didn't expect to, to be talking about this, but I have thought about it quite a lot. Um, the, the um, imagination, again, it's the child's imagination, um, the inner child's imagination of those westward settlers that identified with part of what it was that they were seeing as far as Indians, the, the, the Indians they admired, um, the energy of that concept and the ideas uh, around freedom and um, living in harmony and connection with the land, what, what Native Americans obviously had culturally, spiritually, um, that the, uh, the white settlers didn't possess. And um, they, they were, you know, there was a certain kind of jealousy about that, you know, and we've romanticized it over and over in films. And, um, you know, I don't have a position except that, you know, I mean, the atrocities that were committed were atrocities. And uh, I feel like my place is to pose the questions and you know i don't i don't have any answers but i do have i have the artifacts of children's play in the 20th century and they're cowboys and they're indians and that is the set of motifs that have cemented uh fluidly in our imaginations in the west so there is no escape from the beauty of um, the spiritual uh, concepts there. I mean, we, we're, going to, we're going to have those, those spiritual and aesthetical, uh, the aesthetical, aesthetic uh, concepts moving through us in our visual world. And I don't think that we should stifle our, our creativity and not allow ourselves to to um, paint what we want to paint. And, I, and you know, and I, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, Western artists right now who have begun using more Native American imagery very respectfully and lovingly mm -hmm. in their work. Um, there are um, artists who have begun uh, painting um, black and Hispanic cowboys, you know, the, which were you know, which was a common thing that we're, you know, and, and our, our um, Western heritage painters from the um, earlier times didn't depict those, those other races as the parts, ha having played the parts that they did um, and continue to. So, you know, I think about these things a lot, but when it comes down to it, you know, I'm, I'm in my studio playing with the subjects in the way that I do. And um, I hope I do it respectfully because I've got nothing but, you know, love for them. And I have a lot of Native American friends who seem to like what I do. So well, I, I have to trust them. 
Yeah, and of course, Deacon Turner is one of our great committee yes. members who absolutely, and he's Cherokee, and and he yes. sits on the, the you know the board of the Cherokee Nation, and he adores your work, and so that was you know wonderful, and so you know I w- I want to pick up on a couple things that you said there, um, and so Dean Mitchell, who's a wonderful uh, black artist uh, in Florida. And um, he actually has been painting, doing a number of paintings of of uh, reservation lands. And it was interesting because he he was saying that painting that landscape and painting what he was seeing and the sort of this destitute and the life and what was happening there just brought him back to his youth. Um, and the poverty he grew up in, and he mm-hmm. so he brought this part of himself to it, and and I'm and and I'm feeling that with your work, which is why I really love your work. Is that when you are doing that, you're posing questions. I also think that to me, those questions are these are these things from our youth, and um, they they were this romantic thing, and when especially when you put them in. Uh, uh, like a scenario, like that one large painting you have of the the toys in the canoe, yeah. um, or when you tape uh, paint, yeah, tape uh, torn paper and clouds and stuff. You know, um, it really starts to add bigger questions to the work, which I think is part of what, to me, with your work, I would never get tired of, because it's always constantly asking me questions. Hmm. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, and I think that being in the studio in a meditative space, um, working with the objects and, and building a sky out of clouds, you know, very much being in the studio, I'm a studio painter and it almost kind of becomes like, you know, one's room, you know, the studio is like as an adult and an artist, your studio is like your space where it's just you creating your thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's the perfect place, you know, that's, that's how a kid would normally play, you know, just kind of like, I'm in my room, I've got my toys and I'm doing, I'm expressing myself. I'm feeling uh, the call of my imagination. I'm responding the way I do. And it's, so there's a sincere effort to um, understand and express the uh, promptings that that each artist has when they're in their studio, and I, I I'm grateful that I get to do it for yeah. a living. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. right. And you get that sense too, and that's yeah. where I think, right, with both of the both of your works, um, the works that you you each create, is that probably more than a lot of artists you bring your own like i said baggage you bring your own personality you bring your and then and then these things unfold for you right um so let me toss out a couple more comments amy shern uh um sorry amy if i'm um not saying that right amy shown um writes i came to appreciate the southwest through javon's conception and conception and emotional translation i related very strongly to his colors light and depth yeah that's an amazing thing right that you can give people javon i mean let's kind of talk about that your response and and how people respond to your work yeah um, right. I also, just it's fun. It's really fun to listen to this conversation. And I mean, I, I feel like one of the things just uh, and I'll tie this back in yeah. that occurs to me a lot with this is this question of the lens through which we look at the world and that by being an individual and making art in the world, like y- you interact with the bajillion variables that you have zero control over. And like this, there's there's a real delicate balance, especially if you're going at the heart of issues that are complicated. And whether you mean to in your own, like whether you're like, I'm going to go out the heart of these issues, I feel like it's rare. It's rarely that simple for any artist. Like this question gets back to what is real in this experience we have. Right. And like, there's some reality that's got vibrancy and punch and life in your uh, infatuation and sort of construction of worlds around toys. And then like the, the layers that stem, you know, that, that filter mm-hmm. off or emanate off of that are really cool like cultural fears yeah. about what was going on in sort of american history at the time that the toys were made the experience of being a child that we all share at different you know sections of time in the last in the 20th century 
and then that sort of filters up into now and all these things get get overlaid on top of a toy you know like a toy that's really well done and well done enough that you feel something happening around the toy as well as this presentation of it like the, the one with the indian on the white horse there that just looks like it's jumping right off the you know off the painting and traveling but it's a toy it's not moving at all you know like uh -huh. to me like that part of the, the process is such an interesting dimension because how you curate what happens with the toy then ends up then opens up all of these potential stories where somebody could walk into a room and have a lot of big feelings about what's going on in a painting of a toy and another person could walk in the room and just be laughing and giggling and want to take it home and cuddle it and the point is that diversity of experience yeah, yeah. If a respectful person doing the work as an artist in the place. so I, to me it speaks coming back to something, you know, that I've been exploring in my work a lot lately, which is the lens through which people are looking at the landscape. I have like a 60 painting series of Grand Teton and an ongoing series of Sarah Paternal with Georgia O'Keeffe painted and a set on Taos Mountain that I'm starting for a show, uh, three of which sold out of the show actually just now, Rose, um, that are about how... Uh, th th these these iconic landscape things, you know, Grand Tetons, House Gorge, these big things that that mean so much in in, in like uh, Warhol's icon, American media icon, right? Marilyn Monroe and stuff. These these ways that these big icons, these meaningful symbols, distill down into our personal experience is, is a really rich territory for reflection, especially at times yeah. when there's a lot more social upheaval, ecological upheaval. There's a lot of things going on that relate to how we understand ourselves and understand our world, whether it's each other or the landscape or anything else. So like, I'm so glad that Amy has come to love the Southwest from my paintings. It's not a goal of mine at all, but it's absolutely the point. You know, like I don't have a particular affinity for the Southwest. I just have an affinity for being in connection with moments that are potent and it has led me to being outdoors. So there's this unpredictable trail that has led to me being outdoors for however long this is going to last that then pulls up all of this experience that then I try my best to then respond to and put in a frame of some composition. And I think Michael was talking about, at least I see here, another topic about my paintings about this insight into religious concepts. Like I, I, I that that is really cool to hear. I, mm -hmm. I, I relate deeply and it's why I personally go out into nature is just to relate with as deeply as I can, as unfettered, as un adulted as on anything just the place and see what happens and all sorts of cool things tend to be able to happen because of that process and it ends up bringing up all this other stuff that is over that that sends symbolizes things the storminess behind me like you were saying rose potentially symbolizing all sorts of stuff the vibrancy in my life that entered into my work when my daughter came around or you know like uh, uh, in, in, all of that stuff ends up having a story that's attached to it that's mine as i go into the painting and then leaves at something else when it hits somebody else in the exhibit space or in a show and it becomes theirs at that point. Right. And so when we talk about like letting a painting go, um, I, I will hold a candle for the other side of the experience, Brad, which is I, yeah, it's really hard. Actually. I feel very attached to a lot of the work that I paint. And yet that is the only part of my job. It's like, it's this moving point. If I don't love it in, in my particular emotional constellation, which is not a, like, anything about anybody else, but in my part as an artist, I have to be really attached to the process for a while. Otherwise I don't see, I, I, that's how, that's how I get myself into the work as best as possible. Yeah. After all of the natural integrity enters into my work. And then I have to let that go. That can be tough. And especially in some cases, because my work is about time and about things that never happen again, it's such a big part of why I paint. If I loved that day and I had a big learning, that painting is that moment and it's gone. You know, like the, some of these, you know, these paintings, they're big, like they're stories of every single day. And so some of them are very sentimental and I try to keep one or two like that. Yeah. But I only have so many walls and I, you know, in my, in my world, I actually don't have space for the giant paintings I make. So they don't stay even if I wanted to. But there's something about that that is hard and, and, and melancholy in the process, which is like it's getting to know a good friend and then saying goodbye. There's something actually quite emotional sometimes about that for me. And yet, oh, the whole point. I don't get it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's because maybe I still I still have the toys. Right. Well, there you go. Right. So like, if you can, like, if you can go and make it again, right on. But yeah. like. 
I guess for me, yeah. I just can't, and I feel that acutely, you know. And so, like, it, it, it's a it's a thing to let him go. But also, I will say, by the time I have a show, I've moved through that process, and I am on to a whole other body of work. Always, by the time a show is in the public sphere, I, I have been thinking about something else for at least six months, usually. Right. It's not right. a quality thing about the work. It's just I I, I necessarily, as an artist, am always asking the, the next question, and mm. I think that part, in terms of my attention. And where I'm occupied, it, it, I relate deeply to what you're saying, Brad, which is like, as soon as I'm done with one thing, I'm like, but there's the, the, like 15 other things I've been wanting to do. Can I, I'm going to go do those now. You know, like that part happens, but there is a, a sense of attachment to some paintings. Usually they're not necessarily the ones that are the best executed. They might be the ones that have the most learning embedded. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, give away the ones that you learned a lot. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely, I can relate to that a little bit. I mean, I have some paintings that were done at pivotal moments. Right, right. Um, but they're usually things, you know, they're the ones that, um, where I made breakthroughs technically, where I was like, okay, now I got it. And I got the light and the form mm -hmm. and in a way that I hadn't gotten it before. And then, th so those things, you know what? I have, a, I have a few of them. Yeah. I yeah. And I really I have I feel like because that's the personal story of yeah. growth as an artist in some part, right? Sure. In this, in, yeah. In, in yeah. The world and also on the personal path. And so for yeah. me, where I have a few personal growth are ones that often are around. And they're usually, they're, a lot of times, they're smaller pieces of mine because the bigger ones yeah. are I articulate the things that I've been distilling out elsewhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So something I feel like we're like we started with, and I think it's it's woven throughout this conversation. Um, and, and I want to wrap back around to it is is the humanity in in the work. And um, you know, we we had also kind of touched on history, um, history of our country, and 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 you know, Brad, like you were talking about playing Indian, and I put that in the comments by Philip um, J. Deloria. Yeah. 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 Uh, if anyone wants to check that out. And then, you know, and Michael's comment here about God and art um, and the remarkable insight. And, and, you know, I mean, I think a really famous um, um, example of the artist influencing um, life and history and um, it is Thomas Moran and the paintings he did of Yellowstone and how those influenced Congress at the time to set aside Yellowstone is the first national park in the world. Um, so artists were able to do that for, for humanity. And I think also, I mean, throughout, well, God, look at uh, uh, cave paintings, you know, the La Sculpte cave painting. I mean, uh, you know, we look back at what we were doing as humans through the artwork that we can find. Um, and I'm wondering, as we kind of wrap this, can you believe it's been an hour, even with all of my fumbling around in the beginning? Apologies, everyone. Thank you for hanging in. You did great. Um, as we come back around, you know, I wonder if you would each talk about how you see your work contributing to that. And I don't mean this in a way of, you know, hey, pat yourself on the back, boys. I, I really mean, like, how do you kind of, what are, if you thought about what your contributions were at this point, what, or what you would like them to be, what would that be? Well, my contribution is uh, to offer some levity, you know, and some some balance and beauty and play and levity, and um, you know, um, I just I want to bring what's most valuable to me, and what I love most in life is joy, laughter, um, and aesthetic beauty, you know? I mean, those are the things. Um, I, I want a person who has a painting of mine in their, in their home to walk around the corner, see it, and laugh a little bit, but also have that feeling of, uh, you know, that you get when you look at colors that are balanced beautifully together, you know? I mean, it might as well, it could be an abstract painting. Yeah. If the colors are right and it, 
you feel that the tone of that in your spirit, you feel it. Yeah. Um, so I want to bring that balancing, nurturing vibration to people through my art. Be, and because I experience it so much when I'm so grateful I get to do this for a living. I, I mean, I can't even believe it. It's like I get to move color and light into position and have a spiritual experience in, in front of the easel every day. Sometimes it's difficult and there are challenges to overcome technically and I've got to make all the right moves to get where I want to go. But I know how to do that now and I do it um, as my contribution to this world. I'm just doing the best thing I can do the most with the most integrity and authenticity that I can muster. And I just, you know, I just, I lay my cards on the table and yes. um, that's, that's what I, that's what I bring. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, Javon, hey, let me throw in a couple comments here and then I want you to jump in if you would. Marilyn Manning writes, I hate to leave, but I must. I've so enjoyed this discussion between you all, even though it felt a bit like eavesdropping. <laughs> hey, good. Yeah, we want to really, yeah, this is this is us talking. Sneaking um, into the studio with us. Yeah, you're in with <laughs> us. Uh, wonderful work behind both of you two artists. Thank you for giving me a look-see at your work. I will continue to enjoy online, Javon. And Michael writes, uh, there is such an interesting interplay between a landscape painting providing a definition of God and a painting of a toy that provides that warm, gentle smile of, of remembrance. Both of those are such a valuable expression of necessary emotion. Yeah, Javon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I relate to a lot of what Brad said. I feel like, and, you know, many artists do, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to spend your time doing something. Hopefully you're contributing in a way that uh, inspires good in the world and, and some sense of resonant, heartfelt sharing of something. Yeah. So I, sh you know, I, I relate a lot to what Brad said. I guess, you know, with my particular subject and my background in doing uh, worked on environmental issues of all sorts for a while prior to painting full-time. You know, there's an embedded affinity and appreciation for the landscape and our reliance and need and treatment of it and the things that those relate to. You know, and um, when you talked about Thomas Moran and Yellowstone, you know, I was also thinking about the, all the Hudson River School painters and how they their, their, their work impacted the public psyche of the U.S. so substantially that even in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, when they, you know, John Muir and all these other guys were working on broader conservation efforts that have led to national parks and national forests and wilderness areas and all these ideas of the, you know, that, that essentially codifies and, and also symbolize our value of nature and not forgetting that, right? How important it is. That's embedded in my work, but I don't want it to be what is like screaming in front of people about like nature matters and everything else. You know, that's not yet. Like I did enough environmental advocacy to feel like there's a, a end to how useful that can be. And that actually what's been more useful is mobilizing emotion. That is the common connection we share and that in my case, for whatever reason, I get to do it with landscape. And I also just cannot believe I get to do this for a living. It's, it, it, you know, more and more, it just kind of blows my mind that mm -hmm. I get to go out and pay homage to places that I think are incredibly powerful for all sorts of reasons, big and small, you know, yeah. and then share that with the world and have it received as the coolest thing. And, it, you know, just a, one last little thing about this kind of connection between landscape and spirit or religion you know, a lot of my reading in the last couple of years has been on that vein of what I've been, you know, developing, thinking in terms of why landscape at all and what that means, you know, in this world, what's the context. And I will say, I, I find a lot of interest in the historic Chinese landscape painters and this idea of the landscape reflecting human spirit in some way. And so the, the story that we can tell in the landscape being this valuable metaphor right the dark and the light the, all these things that you could talk about and how that feeds into things and and then you know that being one layer of kind of this 
you know, a sort of fun story. And then there being another layer of time and change actually triggering development in my experience. And that when I see 15 paintings of Taos Gorge at the same spot, I see a million years or 10 million years. And I see an afternoon of a thunderstorm right sandwiched on top of each other. And then I see a winter storm that blacks and whites everything out. And then I see, you know, the middle of the night and all these stories that develop through time and tell about change, about one thing and how one thing can change depending on what's going on around it, to me is the extension of, of, of I think, where I'm personally going about how something can, can be so familiar and so different, so, so normal and so miraculous, this kind of tension between even that you can see into relationship, right? Your, your closest partner can be the person that you love the most dearly and feel the most to have out. You know, the, 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 the intensity of what it is to be pulled in multiple directions at once, I think for me is something that increasingly I'm seeing coming out of my interaction with landscape as a subject. Never thought it would happen. Totally hope that this develops for the people who see my work and that it ends up being something I can continue to, to play with in a, in a personal and a public sphere. Wow. So. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Well, God, believe it or not, it's 10 after one. Hey. <laughs> all right. um, uh, Blake Welch says, thank you all. Um, all of you who are listening and hanging in there with us. Thank you so much again. Sorry for the uh, weirdness at the beginning, but um, yeah, boy, me and technology, uh, if I'm not doing it every day, it's gone out of my head. So um, Chuck McCoy says, thanks to all. Um, I want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Javon. Thank you, Brad, for being here. I appreciate your time. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you, everybody who participated in, um, and listened in and sent your questions. And we're just here. I really appreciate it. Um, we've got talks all next week, and we've got a film premiere um, on Saturday, uh, a short documentary film that was made in the yards by one uh, by an artist. And uh, so that's Saturday. And the show is still open for sale and just wonderful works by both these artists as well. Um, so please check out the website, Coors West art.com and um, we're going to keep the show open through the last day of january thank you all for letting us do that and um so uh yeah uh if you have any questions or comments you can email through the core show and let me know and we'll get those questions going next time so devon brad thank you as always i so thank you it. thank you so nice to see you <laughs> take care Bye. Bye.